Newfoundland uh, has a history that is, in some respects, I think, similar to Canada's, but in some respect, uh, some respects, quite different as well. Even the date 1867 really is not that significant to Newfoundlanders. It doesn't have the same kind of meaning that it does for Canadians. 1867, obviously, the big year of confederation for four provinces and others uh, falling uh, into confederation shortly after that. But, but Newfoundland was outside of that until 1949. Um, not to say now that there weren't some overtures, and in the 1860s, a couple of representatives from Newfoundland did go uh, up with the Canadians and have discussions, uh, Frederick Carter and Ambrose Shea. Uh, it was a really difficult time in Newfoundland, though there was an economic uh, recession, and uh, Newfoundland had the same kinds of suspicions, I think, about uh, becoming part of this federation that could be very sort of oriented towards the center, as perhaps other uh, uh, maritime uh, areas did at, the, uh, at that period. And so, uh, yeah, they, they came back to Newfoundland all gung-ho about uh, uh, joining Confederation, but uh, the anti-Confederates won the day. And there's a, a rhyme that uh, we used to say, actually, when we were kids, uh, and that will tell you how long this sort of sense of, of these two guys being somewhat, you know, uh, up there trying to betray Newfoundland. It goes, uh, remember the day when Carter and Shea went over the way to barter away the rights of Terra Nova. So that's in my memory, my cultural memory. So yeah, that, that hung around for a long time. Uh, but as I say, 1949, probably our confederation date, very late in the game. Uh, so we did a lot of sort of moving along uh, on, on, on our own speed, I'd say. Uh, we actually, in, in terms of, I think, differences in our history, um, well, we do, we do have uh, a, a past with, with uh, indigenous peoples that is complicated, just as in other parts of, of uh, North America. We sadly are, are the only place, though, that actually had an indigenous group actually be erased from the face of the earth, and that was the Beothic. So, I mean, we 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 have Inu and Inuit, uh, Mi'kmaq, uh, in the southwest, and the Beothic, uh, who were in mostly in the the northeast coast. And uh, what happened to them is is debated. Uh, some people say they were delib deliberately exterminated by by Europeans, uh, particularly English settlers. There were some skirmishes between them and and English settlers, especially trappers over trap lines and whatnot. So that that certainly did happen. But I think primarily what you're looking at is them moving away from uh, European activity and therefore moving away from the coastline where the Europeans were and that cut them off from their uh, coastal resources and they really essentially virtually starved to death in the interior and this made them susceptible to disease there was no um, you know uh, campaign to exterminate them no deliberate policy uh, and actually you know as as they were sort of reducing to final numbers they um, the colonial authorities actually tried to help, you know, in the way the colonial authorities helped in those days by bringing them in and, and uh, trying to uh, nurse and educate, but it, it was too late. So that's a very, very sort of sad and tragic moment, I think, in Newfoundland's history. Um, but European presence, again, there was a, for Newfoundland, the, you know, the, the big game in town, and really the only game in town for a long, long time was the fishery. So you have an international fishery taking place uh, off the island. Uh, you've got Portuguese, uh, Basques uh, from Spain, uh, France, you've got England, uh, all of them wanting to take advantage of the wonderful opportunities in, uh, in terms of fishing for cod in particular off Newfoundland. Uh, the English were the only ones who actually needed a ground base. Uh, the other countries did a lot of heavy salting and brought the fish back to, to Europe uh, uh, green, as we'd say, not dried at all. But the, the English did a different kind of cure. So they had less salt, so they lightly salted and dried the fish on the shore. So that's how the English got their foothold in there. They also would pick up Irish fishing servants uh, and cheap provisions for the fishery. So you've got this big industry coming out from the west of 
England, or the West Country, as it was called. Coming out to Newfoundland in the spring of the year, there would be big fishing boats with smaller boats on board for people to fish from. There'd be big sack boats that would take provisions, and they would bring the fish to market at the end of the season. And they all came out, and eventually a, 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 a naval escort came with them. So it was, a, it was quite a scene. Uh, they would arrive at the end of, of the spring and set up the premises, build a shorefront premises, do their fishing, dry it on shore, and then later in the fall go, it would all go back to market and the fishers would go home. What happened, of course, uh, there was no real sort of uh, property rights. There were no property rights. There were no sort of legal uh, uh, trappings in Newfoundland at the time. So you went off in the fall, when you came back in the spring, somebody else might be set up where you had been the year before. So people started leaving uh, winter crews behind. Eventually, some people started to stay and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, a resident fishery began to sort of form. And for a while, the, the resident fishery and, and the migratory fishery went hand in hand. Uh, the there's, there's a, a sense that the West Country merchants didn't like the settlers and wanted to get them off the island. That did happen for a while, and they were a very strong lo lobby in England, and successfully in the late 17th century lobbied the English government to keep them, keep them away. Uh, but eventually, you know, the West Country merchants themselves thought, well, this is great. They, they do stay and protect the premises. We can provision them and take their fish back to America. This will all work out fine. So they were on board, but the English government, and, and soon to be British government, uh, really didn't want the center of that big fishery to move out of the west of England. So they were much slower to uh, allow settlement to happen or to even encourage it. But it, it trickled along anyway, and as the migratory fishery ran into difficulties in the 18th century, because it was it was constantly warfare. Anybody who has studied North American history will know this. Uh, it was usually European warfare that played out uh, on this side of the ocean as well. But, uh, you know, migratory ships coming back and forth, very vulnerable to en enemy attack and whatnot. So the resident fishery grew stronger and stronger as the migratory declined. So then you have this, this population that are there. What are you going to do with them? So they did start to allow different forms of, of uh, sort of courts and, 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 and governance. But it wasn't until 1825 that Newfoundland was uh, declared an official colony of Britain. So for the longest, longest time, Britain or England and then Britain thought of Newfoundland as just this big fishing station where people came and went. There's a lovely quote about it being a, a giant ship moored off the great, the Grand Banks. The Grand Banks being the big, big fishing ground off Newfoundland, off the south coast. So you can imagine then how differently things evolve there in terms of settlement and, and uh, demographic patterns, it, the economy, uh, the political life of the place. Uh, very much, um, you know, not not keeping a pace of the of the mainland colonies at all.